Good morning. And welcome. If you've been with us for a while or this is your first time, welcome today. And this is a uh, good time to visit us. We're actually starting something new today. So today is the first day we'll be starting to look at the book of John. So you haven't missed anything. If you do miss anything, you can catch up next week. So the series we're looking at is we're going to start in chapter 1 today, and we're going to skip ahead actually next week quite a bit to chapter 16. And that's because what we want to do is start to walk towards Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter along with Jesus. And so we'll prepare that time to look at actually a large portion of John's gospel, which is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. And so when we come to Palm Sunday, we'll have to skip back to chapter 12. But it will all tie together nicely as we come to Easter. And then right after Easter, we'll return back to the beginning of John, the second half of chapter 1, and just walk through passage by passage to see really who is this Jesus Christ. What does he say about himself? What does he call disciples to? And this is a great book because of John's high Christology, of his understanding, of his view, and the difference that he states subtly about this Jesus Christ and the way he focuses on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so that's where our messages will rest too, on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And as we, as we come to the I Am statements, we'll actually group those together in a six-week kind of mini-series within this series to put them all together to walk through, which will cover quite a few chapters through those, but to look at them all together about Jesus' self-description, about who he reveals from his own lips, who he says he is, and what that means for us, and how we can go and share that with people. But I encourage you as a people to be expectant during this time. We'll be in the book of John for a while into summer, and I don't want this just to be a week, another week of information and information from the book of John, but that really that we can be expectant of what God will say to us, what God will do in us as his people, what he will teach us, what he will reveal to himself simply from reading his scripture and having it proclaimed and coming together to understand this, who Jesus is and what he has done. And as we do, I encourage you that this is a great time if you're, if you're not in a community group or you've been out of one for a while to, to talk to our office here and join a community group. This is a great time. Again, it's right at the beginning to come into a group and then week by week discuss this together, share this together, apply this together, and come expectant to your group about what God will do, what God will say as we focus on his word in the book of John. So as we come to the book of John, this is John the Apostle. John, one of the original 12 disciples who has written this book, the same author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John of the book of Revelation. John who's called the beloved disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved. And many believe that John wrote this gospel in Ephesus. And that the book was completed either by A.D. 70, right, as Jerusalem fell and the temple was destroyed, or at the latest by 90 or 100 A.D., but that this is a first century gospel. And if you're familiar with the book of John, it stands separate from what we call the synoptic gospels, or the other three of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's separate in some of the content that it has, some of the style that it has. But it's also amazing when you hold them together, how you see the continuity, even in the differences, how they present the same Jesus. And how when you compare these Gospels to later Gospels and Gnostic Gospels and really false Gospels, how you can see that John, even though different than these other three, is clearly talking about the same person. And it's a blessing that God has given us four Gospels not to be repetitive, but to show us different aspects of the same story from different points of view of his people as he has inspired them. 
Interesting, John in his book doesn't include all the parables that the synoptics have. He doesn't talk about all the miracles that they talk about. He only talks about seven and calls them signs, signs that reveal the person and power of Jesus Christ, which is something very important for John in this book is that we know who Jesus is, that we know him. He doesn't talk about Jesus' temptation or his ascension. He doesn't give us Jesus casting out demons or the Lord's prayer. But what's amazing, what we find in this fourth gospel is that we find the first miracle, the one at Cana, where water turns into wine, that this is the gospel, the only one that includes Lazarus being raised from the dead and what that means. And again, that two-thirds, two-thirds of this book is devoted to the very last week of Jesus' life, that John This apostle, this disciple, this author puts a spotlight as a focus onto this important time in redemptive history of Jesus and what he does and what he says during this last part of his stay on earth. And John also gives us his great purpose about why we should read this book, why we should know this. He tells us in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, There are many things that Jesus did that I did not put in this book. I didn't write them all down. But what I have been told to record from eyewitnesses, from my own eyewitness account, what is there is with a great purpose so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ. And in believing in his name, you will have eternal life. He's given us the mission of the book. And he's given us the the central focus, Jesus and then what he has done and accomplished. John will use that word witness and testify many times throughout this book. He uses it in the verb 33 times. He uses the noun 14 times to talk about testify and witness. Today, as we open up John 1, he will talk about John the Baptist witnessing and testifying to the person and the mission of Jesus Christ. And that word testify and witness is where we get our English word martyr today. We talk about, and he's talking again and again about this martyr, 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 this witness of who Jesus is. And he wants us to know that this is eyewitness account. This is what has been revealed to him. And John writes it with some distance between the events as he has been following Jesus. Even as Jesus ascended, he's been evangelizing for Jesus. He's been suffering for Jesus. He's been teaching about Jesus Christ. And he writes this down that we will know that same Jesus. In one sense, I think there's a goal in this book that we too will be like that beloved disciple, that we will be the ones loved by Christ, the ones who will follow Christ, even in the face of persecution, that we will talk and praise and worship the real Jesus Christ and share and proclaim his gospel These martyrs in this book, these witnesses, are testifying to the greatest question of all human life. Who is this Jesus? And then what will we do with him? And John has given us the answer in his book. He says that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the Son of God, the King of Israel, the one Moses and the prophets have been talking about. He is our great rabbi. And then from the mouth of Thomas, he is my Lord and my God. And John himself has written this gospel as his answer. And in a way, he invites us in that this is kind of like a courtroom. That's why there's a little scales up there. Jesus the King comes, who he is. What does he do? He dies for us, and then there's a verdict. What will we now do with him? How will we respond? And that way, too, all of human history has been making that same judgment since Jesus Christ stepped onto this earth. Who is he and what will we do with him? We can't erase him. We can't blot him out. Lord knows we've tried. So what will we do with him? How will we answer? So let's look at Scripture. And as we do, let's pray. Lord Jesus, will you humble us as we come to your word? that you will open up our eyes, open up our hearts, and that by the simple reading of your word and proclaiming, Lord, that you will teach us 
what you want to say to us, that you will continue to reveal yourself here today as you have done for many years through the reading of this gospel. Lord Jesus, will you shepherd us into all truth and understanding of who you are, mature us by your word, sanctify us by the hearing of your word, and lead us to be people who know this gospel story, who proclaim this gospel message, and are a community centered on Jesus Christ and his gospel, that in the reading of your word today, Lord, we might truly more fully know you and you crucified. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So let's start in chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 18 and then skip down to 29 to 34. Verse 1, chapter 1 of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And then to verse 29. The next day he saw, that's John the Baptist, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you will see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John, again, it tells us that the key question of Jesus Christ is knowing him, of knowing who he is, of knowing the real Jesus and the fullness of who Jesus is as he has revealed himself. This is a way that you could almost split this book, and it goes through these chapters. One through six, Jesus gets introduced in many different ways. And then chapter seven through 12 there's, we see the Jewish people, his own people that he came to, arguing about him. And even though they walked among him, even though they met him, even though they interacted with him, they did not know him. We see his own brothers confused about who he is. And people that think they know where he came from, but don't really know. And as the chapters go on, Jesus starts to reveal himself more personally, more profoundly, about exactly who he is, and calls people to follow him, people to come and see him, people to come and know him. And in this 
understanding, this word will be important throughout John, is this word of truth and how closely it's linked with Jesus, who will later say, I am the truth. And part of knowing him and part of knowing the truth is connected to his identity. When the signs come up and the healer Jesus shows himself, there are signs that point out to know who he is and what he can do, and he can do the works of God. And then he will reveal himself in these I am statements to say, will you know me, know me that I existed before Abraham, know me that I am the great I am, know me that I am your all and in all, I am the everlasting God, the true food, the true life, and the vine. And again, this word witness, if you heard it in those, that this opening prologue, how many times it's used to say again, I'm testifying and witnessing that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's important because you hear in the language even of John, he says, I did not know him, John the Baptist. I did not know him, but he was revealed to me by the Father. That even though he was family relation, John the Baptist did not know who Jesus Christ really was, but he says it was clearly revealed to me. I saw it, and I saw a sign of this, and I testified to you and testified to the world around me of who he is. In that way, again, this is like being brought into the courtroom by John the Apostle, John the writer here, as we question and people go back and forth about who Jesus is. You know, the disciples that he calls in chapter 2 are asking questions. They're probing. Could you really be the real Messiah? You know, Nathaniel scoffs and says, there's no way this could be the one. Because he couldn't come from that town. Others come forward to examine him. Nicodemus comes in the night and kind of pokes around and digs into Jesus. Who are you really? And John the Baptist gets asked again, is this really the real Jesus? the real Messiah. A Samaritan woman meets Jesus and realizes that he's a teacher of some kind. He's a prophet, but she wonders if it's more, and she's still waiting on the Messiah. And then more Jews come to find out who he is, and even as he does these signs pointing, they question to the point that when he enters Jerusalem in his triumphal entry afterwards, people are grumbling and questioning, and people are saying, this must be the Christ, and other people are saying, no, he's crazy. This can't be the one. We see even in John that the leaders are starting to silence eyewitnesses, people that Jesus healed, people that Jesus saw, and they say, be quiet. They ask Jesus, say, tell the disciples that are shouting Hosanna to be quiet and not say these things about you. But Jesus says, I have revealed who I am, and my creation must respond to that. And then Jesus will stand in front of Pilate, and Pilate will ask, who are you? And throughout this, it's an amazing picture. The creator of everything, we're told by John, who made all and for whom all things have been created. He's standing in front of his creation. He's walking among them, some of them touching him, some of them believing they have power over him. And he's standing there looking at them in a strange irony, and a sad irony. His old creation is kind of shrugging back, looking at Jesus, saying, who are you again? Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? Are you really who you say you are? You know, the gospel that we're going to spend this time in ends with this beach breakfast, and Jesus comes back and reveals himself to his disciples, and he asks the one who denies and betrays him, he says, do you love me? And he's getting behind it. He asks him three times, do you love me? Do you really know me? Do you trust me? And that disciple Peter says, yes, I do. And you are Lord. You know this. And he gives a testimony to who Jesus is. And so as we come throughout this, we have to enter into that courtroom, so to speak, and weigh the evidence and continue to say, well, we let Jesus speak and tell us who he is. We let his words speak and tell us who he is. These, these, these questions that Jesus asks are questions that we could ask just about anyone. The questions that I think John is bringing up here is simply, 
Who is this Jesus? Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? Are those questions you ask people regularly when you meet them? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? And these are questions that we're coming to this scripture, this Bible, and asking. They're big questions, but they're also simple questions. And the first one that Jesus is answering is that who Jesus is, is that he is fully God. You know, it's interesting, John doesn't start with the genealogy or the birth narrative like Matthew and Luke. He doesn't start like Mark at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry with his baptism. It's almost to say, you know, my brothers have already written about that, but I'm zooming back and back and back to show you that this gospel and this Savior started long before Bethlehem long before Mary and Joseph, long before even the genealogy that goes back to King David and beyond. He says, long before that, there is Christ. He says, in the beginning was the Word. This in the beginning will recall to any faithful Jew reading this and us who are students of the Old Testament to immediately think of Genesis and think of in the beginning There is God, Trinitarian God, creating and making out of nothing everything that we see. Out of the chaos and out of the darkness, the light comes, and the Creator is shaping reality, time, and space. And the Word was with God, again, telling us, That this word, this logos, who he will later say is Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ is with God the Father and yet is distinct from God the Father. He's with him and yet he is not exactly the same. That there's a distinction between the Father and the Son, the persons of the Trinity. And then he says, to make it clear for us, and the word was God. That this word, Logos, this Jesus Christ, this Messiah, is fully God. And he is distinct from the Father, but not in any way diminished or less than the Father. He says, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Who is he? He is the creator. He is the Lord over all. And John can witness to the people that he's talking to, people like us. This Jesus who made the planets and made the heavens, he also made your heart and your mind. He knows the hairs on your head because he made them. He knows the chromosomes in your body because he has ordered them. This God who made you is the God that I'm talking about. This is the one. You know, this, this, what we just read in those just first verses, that was enough to keep theologians busy for the first 300 years of the church, trying to put this together and understand what he's saying. He is with God. He is God. He made all things, so he could not have been made. And yet there was a time that he entered into time and space and dwelt among us. And then John gives us these two words that are very important about understanding who Jesus is as fully God. He says he is the life. He is life and he is light. He is the light. He is a source of life, but he's even more than just the goal of life or an ideal life, that he is life himself. And apart from him, there is no real life. He will later say that he is the vine from which we receive all life, all sustenance, and apart from him, we amount to nothing. We can do nothing. He says he is the light. He's the very light by the the word by which all things are exposed. That this light goes into the darkness and separates it out and reveals. But when the Bible talks about this fallen world, it uses the opposite of those two words, doesn't it? And when we look at our news headlines, we see the opposite of those two words. It's not life and light, but it's death and darkness. Darkness and death, they abound in our world, do they not? And John is saying, we saw real life. We testified to true light, to the real God. Around here, there is biological life. There is biological light. 
but all of it is slowly dying and all of it is slowly dimming unto darkness. And he says, but we saw the one in whom there is no death and there is no darkness, in whom there is no evil, the real God. John is telling us these ultimate things about Jesus. It seems he wants to have our minds fixed, to have our minds clear and be sober that from the beginning of his gospel, the eternal majesty of Jesus Christ, fully God, is revealed to us. That the creator is standing right before him. The judge of the world and the maker of the world and the savior of the world in Jesus Christ. Then he also goes on to tell us that question of where Jesus comes from, answering also who he is, that he is fully human. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word became flesh. Again, John wants to be clear, Jesus didn't merely take on the appearance of a man or adopt the form of a body, but that he took on what it really means to be fully human, full humanity, in a real sense, more human than any of us. Because when he could take on humanity, he can take on unfallen humanity, humanity that knows no sin, humanity that knows no separation from God, but he takes on full humanity and becoming human, that he takes on real flesh, that Jesus could get tired, that Jesus got hungry, that Jesus slept, that Jesus cried. And this word that he became flesh is a powerful word. It says, in addition to him taking on humanity, real humanity, real flesh, real bones, real blood, that behind this word is this picture that Jesus fully God, tabernacled among us, that he dwelt among us, he tented among us, he put his tent up here on earth. If you remember that tabernacle in the Old Testament before the temple that Solomon built is a place where God would meet his people, where in a real sense, not that God was confined to any place, but that heaven touched earth and met earth in a very tangible, real way, that God's glory filled that presence. And people could see there is a God, and he is holy. And they dare not draw near as unclean people. But in the ultimate revelation of God with us, what we talk about with Emmanuel, veiled in flesh, God is now standing in front of John the Baptist and John the Apostle, tabernacling among them, that his presence is here. That's why he can say, I am the ultimate temple, the real dwelling place of God. I am here. That the king has stepped foot on earth, and so the kingdom of God is near. It is here. It is imminent because Jesus the king is here. And now people can approach this God, this holy God, fully God, and can stand in front of him and look upon him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that the divine Christ entered our humanity. And this is shocking. This is awesome. This is a supreme moment of visitation of the Creator to His creation, the eternal with the temporal, the unconditioned with the conditioned, the infinite with the finite. Blows your mind, doesn't it? And then when this logo stepped down, all of life began to make sense to those who received him because the purpose and the author of human life had appeared before them. Our lives are vainly searching for meaning and purpose and trying to write out our own existence and create ourselves. And instead, the creator is standing in front of humanity and some receive him and some push him away and hide in the darkness. We don't have the most time to go in and explore all of these, but it's important to bring up that what John has said and when he is writing this is definitely combating heresies about what we have just said, the dual nature of Jesus Christ, 
that he is fully human and fully God had perplexed church leaders who had a different worldview maybe they started from or didn't understand parts of Revelation or it got corrupted, but they were confused. And many of these were leaders in the church, some of them even bishops, but these, these false Jesuses started to appear in these different movements. Some of them were named after their founders. Some of them were named because of what they taught. In Apollinarianism, this is a fourth century heresy, and what it's dealing with is that Jesus is not fully human, that he might have a human body, but he has a divine mind, and that these two cannot coexist. They cannot be in union together. In one sense, this really taught that Jesus didn't coexist in one person, divine and human, because his humanity also would not be sinless. That his eternal mind was taken over by the Logos. Even if he had a human body or a human soul, his mind and really his spirit was not human. He was not fully human. Docetism is a Gnostic heresy that came up, which is fought a lot of the, in the epistles of the New Testament. And even in John's time here, as John goes and says that Jesus took on flesh, docetism comes from the word of meaning to seem like in Greek. And the Gnostics believed that Jesus was maybe at best a phantasm or like a ghost or maybe some celestial substance, but he was not humanity. And it come from a belief of a duality that Gnostic teaching had, that there is kind of a divine holiness or there's a divine supernaturalness that is good, but all things material, all things flesh are bad and corruptible. And so those two could never come together. But the maker of all things who pronounce them good says, I can take on what I created as good and continue. But they said, no, it just seemed that he was a human. This is probably still living today most clearly in what is Christian scientist and the belief that there's a divine mind and that Jesus maybe had a body, but he was really just a Christ mind. In Ebionism, it was, came out of a Jewish sect that believed that Jesus could not be fully God. What they believed is that he was the Messiah, but he wasn't virgin born. But he became the Messiah, he became the Christ because he so perfectly, so fully followed the Torah. He followed the law of Moses so perfectly that he became the anointed one. This is taught today in some messianic Jewish movements. It comes close to what Islam will believe about Jesus Christ, that he is an anointed prophet, that he is a holy person, that he speaks for God but that he is just fully human. The big one that crept up and caused the church to create councils and had to fight this for years and years was a belief called Arianism that came from a leader in the church named Arius. And what he said is that Jesus is maybe semi-divine, but kind of his catchphrase was, there was a time that Jesus was not. And in this one, Jesus was not fully God because he was a created being. He was created by God. The church worked hard to kind of stamp this out, but this continues today in what is Jehovah's Witnesses, who will believe that Jesus Christ is a created being. He can be venerated. He had some part to play in our salvation and a role, but he is really the archangel Michael. And he is not fully God. He was created. Similar in Mormonism, where Jesus is a spirit child of God the Father, and he's the brother of Lucifer or Satan. But he is not the God. He is not fully God, but is less than that. But foremost among the teachings of the Gospel of John, of this prologue, is this incarnation. That Jesus is fully God and fully man. And when we say that, what we mean is that God added unfallen humanity to his undiminished deity. He added unfallen humanity to his undiminished deity. It does not in any way mean that our Lord's deity was diminished or set aside. There's a false teaching today, probably most loudly or profoundly, in Bill Johnson of Bethel Reading Church and Jesus Culture Music. And he says that Jesus' 
laid aside his divinity, that when he was on earth, he was purely just human so that he could fulfill the mission of God, relying on the Holy Spirit for all the power and works. And he laid apart his divinity, laid it completely aside. And what Johnson wants to smuggle in the back door is a message to us that says, you too then can do anything that Jesus Christ did because he just had the Holy Spirit and so do you. But brothers and sisters, that's not a fully God, fully human Jesus then. It's not the same Jesus that I believe John is talking about here. This, this Jesus could not, did not lay aside his deity. What it does mean is that certain manifestations of his glory were veiled. And that the use of some of his powers was voluntarily restrained. Some of his divine powers he voluntarily restrained. It does not mean that our Lord was created in Bethlehem. But only that he came down to earth at his incarnation. It does mean that the baby in the manger was God, manifested in human flesh. Fully God, taking on full humanity. Later, the Chalcedonian Council in 451 AD made a definition of this as it was a struggle in the early church. And it's still an amazing, clear definition. I encourage you to look it up. It's the Chalcedonian definition of who Jesus is. Briefly, what it says is, Following the Holy Fathers, we, with all one accord, teach men and women to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God, truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood, like us in all respects, apart from sin, as regards his Godhead, begotten of the Father before the ages." But yet, as regards his manhood, begotten for us men and for our salvation of the Mary the Virgin, the God-bearer, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, recognized in two natures, and these are the distinctions, without confusion. That means Jesus Christ, when we talk about his natures being two, is not like you mix blue and yellow and get green. Green is not blue, it is not yellow. Jesus is not like putting in a blender an apple and an orange and blending them up. You no longer have an apple. You no longer have an orange. Jesus doesn't lose any of his godness or his humanity that he is not becoming a third thing. He's not a mix of a divine and a human nature, that he is fully God and fully human. It says also that he is without change. That means when he assumed flesh, this is counter Bill Johnson, when he assumed flesh, he took it on, he did not cease to be what he had always been, God. He did not cease to be. He took on. He did not give up his deity. Without division, which means that he is not half God, half man. He is fully God, fully man. And without separation, that the union of the human and divine in the person of Jesus is a real union, organic union. And this means that Jesus then is not merely a man who was anointed. He's not merely a man who had God within. He was not merely a son of God as we are all children of the Creator. But he was the unique God-man. And this has amazing implications for our salvation, for the gospel we share, for our hope in eternity. And again, briefly, Jesus is important to reveal who he is and what he does. There's too many here to name, but there's so much that just in these verses, John tells us why Jesus came. He came because he shines light into the darkness. He shines light into the darkness with such a power and authority that his light can never be overcome. Not by the evil one, not by the sins of people, not by our lack of faith. He cannot be overcome. And so again, as we go through John, picture this. As he's walking in Judea, as he's walking in Samaria, everywhere he walks, this light is shining into a dark world. 
that he is bringing the full revelation of God is standing there, light breaking into darkness, order and meaning breaking into chaos, righteousness breaking in and overcoming evil and sin. Jesus, the creator, restoring and healing people in the power of God to say, this is the way I intended things to be. It says he gives the right to become children of God, verse 12. He gives that right. Verse 16, he gives grace upon grace. He gives grace and truth that come through him as the ultimate prophet, the ultimate deliverer, the ultimate Moses. Verse 18, so important and too often minimized. He is the one who ultimately makes known the Father, that he came to reveal who the Father is. In verse 29, that he takes away the sins of the world. He takes away the sins of the world. That John can exclaim, John the Baptist, here comes the Lamb of God who will take away our sins, who will redeem us. That there is no animal sacrifice, there is no penance. Here comes the Lamb of God that will fulfill that and redeem us. In verse 33, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is important to think about is what he does and what, who he is. There are always going to be counterfeit gods out there. There's always going to be different Jesuses that pop up, that are sold, that are marketed, that promise some secret knowledge, some special equipping and overcoming. But so too, there are always going to be counterfeit gospels. A writer for the Gospel Coalition named Trevor Wax has written a book called Counterfeit Gods, and in it he says something very powerful. What if the biggest danger to the church of Jesus Christ is not blatant heresy? It's not the moral failures of church leaders or persecution or the rise of Islam or the loss of our rights in America. What if the biggest threat is counterfeit gospels within the church? Ways of thinking and speaking about the good news that lead to a gradual drift from the truth of Scripture. A gradual, slow drift. You know, a recent study by Legionnaire Ministries said that 36% of self-professed, church-going, evangelical Christians, 36% said, quote, by the good deeds that I do, I partly contribute to earning my place in heaven. 36% of people... I mean, those are the modern-day Judaizers that we find in Scripture. That's another gospel. Kenneth Hagin, talking about prosperity gospel. I believe that is the plan of God our Father that no believer should ever be sick. It is not, I state boldly, it is not the will of God my Father that we should suffer. It's another gospel. What about so often the, the gospel of Therapy, a therapeutic gospel. Come to Jesus and your life will get better. Surely your life will get better if you know the Son. John has said that, but what kind of better are we talking about? Often Jesus, this King, this fully God, fully man Jesus, really gets reduced to an accessory to my old life. He becomes not much more than an enabler of my dreams. And then the church and our ministry become an infomercial. Name your problem. We have the answer. Now, what happens in sin in that gospel? The fall is really personal only. It's my failure to reach my potential. It robs me of my sense of fullness. Then what does Christ's death do in that gospel? Christ's death shows me that I have value, that I have worth, and it gives me the power to reach my full potential. God loves you so much, and he wants you to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be a success, to be an overcomer. And here are three keys to unlocking that potential if you buy my book and go to my conference. The church community in that gospel becomes people who help me on my quest to vocational fulfillment, personal happiness. There's all kinds of gospels out there that reduce this. There's the judgmentless gospel, the self-help gospel, you, the center of the Bible gospel, the moralistic gospel, the activist gospel to save the world, the churchless gospel, sadly, even the Christless gospel. 
But you know, these kind of gospels leave us impoverished and leave us hungry. John has started this book before getting to the cross and the passion of Jesus Christ by stating who he is and telling us what he came to do because in this alone will be satisfaction and life. These other gospels are so appealing because they are easy and they are cheap. They cost us less, less in our devotion, less in our walk, less in our sanctification, and they appeal to my flesh. They often put me at the center, but it's like eating a bowl full of candy. It tastes good going down, but then I'm starving, and it didn't actually fix anything that was wrong with me. It didn't fulfill me. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This person of Jesus Christ, this gospel of Jesus Christ, leads us to ask that same question, who is Jesus and how will I respond? I can step into his light or shrink back into darkness where it's more comfortable. And John is writing this saying, I want you to step into that light. I want you to come and investigate. Come and know him more fully. If you know him more fully, if you don't know him, come and see. Brothers and sisters, this is what's interesting for us all too, is that the gospel, the gospel has really a story with it. It has a pronouncement, and it has a community. We need to be people who know that gospel story. That's why we start here in this first part of John, is to see the context and know where John is talking about, not to just rip out passages or talk about aspects of Jesus that, are, that we like or that fit our three points, but to look at the whole story, the gospel story. It has to have context. If you're discipling someone and you want them to grow, invite them to come see the fullness of Christ by reading his word and looking at it step by step, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So often I see these revival movements and big conferences. There was just one in Florida, supposedly 60,000 people, and talk about revival, revival, revival. They have some form of gospel announcement and no gospel story, no context. In six hours of a conference, six hours of presentation, where was the story of Jesus Christ? Where was the gospel story where did I find out about the darkness of people that refused and shrunk back and the people who did not receive him? We need the story. And then as people of the story, brothers and sisters, we do need to go and give the announcement of this gospel. I believe John wants us to do that by reading this too. He says, I've written this so that you will be convinced, so that you will know, because I am sure that he is real. I am sure. And as you come and meet him, as you come and know him, to go forward and announce this great news with people to share it with them. And then, brothers and sisters, there's always needs to be a gospel community. Yes, I am plugging our community groups, but I'm sharing it out of a love for you that here on Sunday, this is community, that we come to hear the word of God proclaimed, that we come to share it and sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron, and to listen to each other and encourage each other on the right path with the right Jesus, with the right gospel, in that there will be life and to hold each other accountable, and to humble ourselves, and to come and read his scripture together. And the best way to do that is with your family, alone with God, and also in community with people, small groups that you can apply this, that you can dig into this, that you can ask questions. I don't understand how Jesus could have two natures. And brothers and sisters, I'm also moved to tell you something I tell myself there are people around us who do not know Jesus, and there are some who think they do, but they do not. I don't enjoy any job of heresy hunting at all, but there are false gospels abounding. They've been in this church. They will come back because they're everywhere, okay? When we know someone who doesn't know the truth of Jesus Christ or they're attached, I just encourage us all to be gentle, to be patient, and to be persistent. There are people who have followed false teachers and false gospels of hyper grace or something else, and they say, that person has changed my life. I have been seen fruit because they have changed me, and that ministry has affected me. It's hard for them to suddenly pull the Band-Aid off and say, I guess I have to throw all of that out. 
So be patient with people. Let them know. This is easy to make mistakes. People can get wrong teaching and wrong understanding. We don't need to be scoffers at people. We need to be encouraging and share with them the truth of God. Okay? And we need to also then, if this is true, and that John is saying knowing Jesus is a matter of life and death, it does move us to share with people the true gospel and to call them back in and bring the light to them and the life and the scripture of Jesus Christ. And if they refuse to persist lovingly because you care about their soul and to share with them this Jesus Christ and to share with them. I've seen my own friends. It's hard to suddenly realize that the gospel of Hillsong might not line up with the gospel of John. And I understand it's tough to come and see and see what people are saying about the person of Jesus, the person of the Holy Spirit, and what this life is really about. But I encourage you that there is truth and the light will not be overcome by darkness. Amen?